This week, my family and I, we watched a lot of movies and TV shows because it's been so dang hot. Anyone else just inside watch? Oh, good, good, good. Uh, we watched, we watched. We watched uh, Nimona on Netflix. I watched Sicario, which was great, but not family friendly. Uh, Levi and I watched Delicious in Dungeon, which is like an anime, super fun. It's like if, round of applause for Delicious in Dungeon? Yeah, it's super fun. It's like if Dungeons and Dragons and like Iron Chef had a baby. It's really good. It's really fun. They fight monsters and they eat them. I don't know. Anyways, let's close in prayer. Father, no, it's a really good show. Uh, so today what I have is some classic movie quote trivia for you. I want to see if you guys, you probably get all of them. So I'm going to kind of show it. We're going to show it and then uh, I'll give you a second or two and then we'll all say it together. The first one's really, really easy. Do you remember this classic one? Say it with me. Nobody puts in the corner, that's right, from Dirty Dancing. The next one is this. I'll give you a second. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. Great job, that's Tyler Durden. Next one. Say it with me. Snakes? Why did it have to be snakes? Well, you guys are good. All right, a little harder. You probably have this one, though. Say it with me. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. That's right, all right, the last two are my personal favorites. The next one, most importantly, I'm not gonna give you any time, say it with me. You smell like beef and cheese. You're not the real Santa. And then of course, words to live by. This is my favorite proverb right here. Beneath the clothes, we find a man. <laughs> Beneath the man, say it with me, we find his nucleus. <laughs> so great. All right, not a movie quote, but I'm sure you know this one. Uh, I'll give you a second. Sticks and stones may, what, break my bones, but words will never hurt me. If you, if you read a lot, like, there's no, like, it's just anonymous. We don't really know who said that, but I, I want to submit to you that whoever said this first was deaf, right? Because this just simply isn't true. Words hurt. They hurt for a long time, don't they? Like for years and years, if not decades and decades. I think all of us have an experience, whether they, like they meant it or not, but somebody said something and it hurt more. That actually, it's healed worse than an actual wound. It's still open. It hasn't even like scarred over. Like I remember I, I was a little kid and I know they were being silly, but I had a family member. I was at the pool and I got out of the pool and they looked at my stomach and they said, hey fatty. I know. And I'll just be like, I'll get way too deep, way too quick. Haven't taken my shirt off at the pool to this day since then. But then also, uh, sometimes we have positive words that kind of heal for a very, very long time. Just quickly raise your hand. If someone says something to you in the moment that's like, yeah, that really resonated with me, and I'm holding on to that. I remember just what comes to mind is my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Green. Um, and I remember it was during recess, and uh, I just had this moment. I was just, I was frustrated at myself. There was something that we were trying to learn that I just, I just was having a hard time. This is so cool, because I don't, I don't know how, how many, like, teachers do this. I know all teachers, like, teachers here do great. But he was, like, at recess, and he threw a football back and forth with me during recess. Because he knew that I was just frustrated with myself. And I remember him saying, let me tell you a secret, Garrett, about learning. Because I've been a lifelong learner. And he said, I always remember this. He said, the smarter you get, the dumber you feel. So the fact that you're frustrated right now is really just evidence that you have a hunger for knowledge to learn. So don't be so hard on yourself. Because even as a teacher, I feel the same way. The smarter you get, the dumber you feel. Oh, I always remember that. So today what we're going to talk about is, is, is the power of words, the importance of using wise words, of using the correct words. And so let me, let me share this with you. In, in our series in Proverbs, Proverbs 18.21 says this. This is kind of our heart for the day. It says this, life and death are in the power of the tongue. There is life that is given and there is death in the power of our words, in the power of the tongue. And I love this too. The, the, those who love it, meaning those who speak, those who talk, those who love to talk, will eat of its fruits. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's saying that we must take our, our, of course, our thoughts, but the words that we speak to ourselves and to others or to people that are in the room or outside of the room, we must understand that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And I, I don't think, like, I, I hope that everyone here, like, doesn't want to intentionally just speak death over someone's life. 
but I, but I think, you know, I think we've all had moments of like, oh, I said the wrong thing. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Like, can we all just raise our hand? We've all had those moments. Like half of you raise your hands. Okay, right? We've all had to like, oh, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that. I didn't say. So, so how do we, how do we say the right thing? Because I, I, Proverbs has so much to say about the power of our words, and so I hope all of us can start at this place of like, I, I don't want to intentionally hurt someone. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to be foolish with my words. I, I want to be someone. I pray that we would all strive to be people that are wise in the way that we communicate, that we are wise and godly in the way that we speak again about ourselves and about others. And so if I, I'm gonna summarize my entire sermon, you write this down, you save yourself so much time. Here's what I believe Proverbs shows us. The how do we say wise words? What do wise words look like? It's this right here, these four things. Proverbs shows us that wise words are, one, from the right person, in the right way, at the right time, and with the right people. Let me say that again. Proverbs has so much to say. Actually, there's like so much that we're not going to hit today when it comes to the subject of our words. But I think Proverbs teaches us, God teaches us, that wise words are from the right person, in the right way, at the right time, and with the right people. That's all I want to break down for us this morning when we talk about the power of our words. And we all, I pray all of us would strive. We've all failed. We've all messed up. We've either said something or posted something that we just shouldn't have done, shouldn't have said. I pray that we all want to strive and grow to be wise people, that again, wise words from the right person, in the right way, at the right time, and with the right people. The first one is this, from the right, or yeah, from the right person. This is interesting. I've been laughing about this all week. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, or rather 26, 17 says this. Interfering in, say it with me, someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. I love it. Like, the word picture that Proverbs has given us is, like, if you're just walking, you just see a stray dog, and you're just like, I wonder what would happen if I did huh, that. Don't do that. That's how you die, right? It's saying, it's just as foolish to be walking into someone else's fight, someone else's argument, someone else's conflict, and go, ooh, I want to get involved. And oh, how many of us live for that? It's saying, don't do that. Interfering with someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. So the first question that Proverbs wants us to think about when we talk about conflict, when we talk about words, this is so important, especially for our political climate and especially for the culture in which we live in. Is this your fight? Are you the right person to speak on this issue, to speak to that person? So many times we get involved in not just because we love the drama, right? We get all frustrated about things that, that should not concern us. Hear us, or hear me, should not concern us. Why are we so stressed about something that should not concern us? Is this your fight? If the answer, is, the answer is yes, then we can continue on. If the answer is no, I think the, the response is pray about it and then let it go. Is this your fight? Interfering with someone else is stepping into something that is none of your business. Is this foolish? Just taking a stray dog and yanking their ears. Is this your fight? Is a key thing. You must prayerfully ask God, should I even be involved in this? And you know what's interesting? I'll be honest, this was a last minute, like yesterday evening addition to the sermon. Because I kind of forgot that there's also a, another thing that Proverbs shows us. It says that there's certain fights that you just shouldn't even try. There's certain conversations you shouldn't even have because the people don't even want to grow. They don't even want to hear. They don't want knowledge. They just want conflict. So let me share this with you. This is Proverbs 9, 7 through 9. It says this. This is harsh words. Again, Proverbs talks about fights that you shouldn't even get into because the person doesn't want wisdom. They don't want wisdom. They want more drama, they want more confrontation, or again, so many times we talk to people and they only want you to confirm what they've already decided. So any wisdom that would push against their sin or their opinion, they view you as an enemy. So this is harsh, but it's right here, read this with me, Proverbs 9, 7 through 9 says this, anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. <sighs> and anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. So what? Correct the wise, and they will love you. 
Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. So I think taking Proverbs, if not Scripture in its entirety, I don't think this verse is telling us, well, they might be a mocker, so I'm not going to go there. I think this verse is speaking to the harsh reality of we've had those conversations, and they go this way. So I think we learn only by lovingly, graciously saying, can I talk to you? And when they all of a sudden, oh, you're, you just hate me. Oh, you, you, do you not understand? Like, oh, so this is who I'm dealing with. So twofold here. I don't think this is excusing us from walking in Matthew 18. Right? This is not excusing us for, from having loving, godly conversations. But there are some times you just need to realize this isn't my fight because all, that's all they want to do is fight. I have to just take this before the Lord. But I'm realizing that every time I try and help them, they hurt themselves out of anger towards me. And so, right, Solomon's like, yeah, I think we've all been there before. But then also, if we can flip it, may we never be these kind of people. May we never, ever, ever be the kind of people that we hear a godly, loving, tearful rebuke and go, oh, you're such a hater. No, may we be the kind of people that want righteousness, that want instruction, that, that want wisdom. Amen? But this is fascinating, isn't it? He's like, don't even bother. There are some people, all they want to do is they just want drama. They just want excuses. They want to be let off the hook right? He's saying there's certain fights you just, you just can't win. I think a good lesson in life that, that sometimes you will spend so much energy trying to help someone that is completely unwilling to help themselves. Sometimes like, it, it could become your full-time job and they'll just say, cool, keep it up. But they won't do anything to grow in wisdom and righteousness themselves. Again, it must come from the right person. Is this your fight? The second thing is this. It must be approached and spoken in the right way. I'm going to share with you Proverbs 15, 1 through 2. I learned so many lessons from Pastor Rick, but this is a verse that continually he would say to us. I have such vivid memories. Uh, it was Kirkley and I in the back seat, and we were in his car going 150 miles an hour down El Camino. Just kidding. Not kidding. You know, he just, he just, he's, got a, he's got places to go. And we'd, we'd be on our way to Subway. He'd order a tuna sandwich with extra onions. And I, <laughs> but I have, sorry, too much details. Um, but I have such a vivid memory of us talking about a church conversation, just church situation. And for, I remember I was in the back left, and he, he looked at me through the rearview mirror. And he just said, hey, Garrett, I want to remind you, this is Proverbs 15, 1, so good. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I'll be honest, 21-year-old Garrett did not like that verse. Because I just want to put gasoline on everything and just watch it explode. I remember the situation, I was like, this is what's going on, this is what they said. And he's like, hey, you remember a soft answer turns away wrath? And in the moment, I was like, stop it. I wanted you to be like, go yell at them. Make yourself feel better, right? I have a hard time with verses like this because it shows me my sinful nature, and it shows my necessity for the Holy Spirit and God's grace. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So there's something like the kill him with kindness. There's something that you can do. When somebody comes here, you go here. And this is easier said than done. Can I get a heartfelt Amen. Right? When the volume is here, I'm like, well, I, just, I, I need to cut through the mix, Taeon, so make my yelling louder, right? Just turn up the fader on my anger. No, a soft answer turns away wrath. Because not only, I think sometimes people, when they're angry, they want you to be even more angry because then that justifies their anger, right? Because, like, you were the loudest voice in the room, so then they're like, well, now I'm off the hook. But there's something truly godly and disarming a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Hear this. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out folly. I will say this. Uh, I get my, both my preaching ability and my volume from my father, Pastor Craig Cruz. I just am wired like him so much. Um, just very much, just naturally loud. Like my dad's loud when he doesn't even try to be. Like he's just, he's just, just, just that kind of person. He sings loudly. If he was here, we'd be like, where's the extra mic? No, it's just Craig. It's just, it's just my dad. But I, 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 to his credit, there were so many moments in, where I, I messed up royally. 
like, uh, <laughs> I'll overshare again. Uh, I was uh, racing to make it home by the 11 p.m. curfew. Uh, it was 10.50 p.m. I was in La Jolla, and I needed to make it to Chula Vista. If you've never been there, that's about a 50-minute drive. You can't make it in 10 minutes. It was pouring down rain. I was leaving my, my, my girlfriend at the time. She's now my wife, don't worry. But I was like, I got to make it home in 10 minutes, and I was sprinting in my little Nissan Versa uh, in the rain, and there's a place in La Jolla where the hill goes like this and then like this. So I went like this and then went like this and then went like this and broke the front axle of my car. There are more details of that story. It's just, it was bad. They called the cops because they're like, what is this? I was just a nervous kid trying to get home by curfew. So I called my dad because he's the only person I could call in that moment. Like, you know, like there are certain things like I, I would have loved to have called my mom, but I broke the car. <laughs> it's time to call dad. Uh, and I always tell him this. He, he was, he's like, I don't remember that, but he was so cool. He was like, are you safe? Yeah, I'm okay. So he drove from Chula Vista at 11 o'clock at night and stayed with me till 2 a.m. for the tow truck to come and take us home. He never really mentioned it again. That was really cool, and I think that's a really cool testament. So I think so many of us, when we approach God, we expect him to be like, how did right? Oh, isn't it the grace, the mercy, the soft, tender voice of God that draws us home? I don't know, that was for free. That wasn't in my notes, but... A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up conflict and anger. We want to say things in the right way. Check this out. Uh, uh, maybe this is Proverbs 16, 21 through 24. Um, I think it's just the beauty of what our words could be and by God's grace should be. Let's say that, or let's read this together. It says this, the wise of heart is called, can you say the word with me? Discerning. It's picking the right words. And the sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. I think sometimes we think that we're heard because we're loud. I think we're often heard because we're loving and gracious and clear, amen? Good sense is a fountain of life to him who has it. But the destruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds again persuasiveness to his lips. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. I love this. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. Sweet to what? Both the soul and health to the body. I pray that our words are discerning. I pray that our words are sweet. Right? A, a soft answer doesn't need a timid answer. A soft answer doesn't need an unclear answer. No, it, there's a tenderness and the clarity and discernment and wisdom. And in turn, it says words like that, they not only nourish our soul, but this is fascinating, nourish our physical bodies as well. So again, we want to be the right person. And we want to say it in the right way. And the third thing is this, at the right time. There's multiple verses on this in Proverbs. Let me just share two with you. Proverbs 15, 23 says this, everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It is a wonderful thing to say the right thing at the right time, right? Amen? Yeah, let me prove it to you this way. Um, you can say the right thing at the wrong time, and then that makes you wrong. Amen, husbands? You ever been there? No? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can say the right thing, but this is just not the time. And that's the wrong way. That's the wrong thing to say. So I want to just submit to you, by God's grace and with his help, to stink and pick your battles and pick your moment. Amen? Yeah. Right? When they are fried and exhausted or they're dealing with something else, right? It's not the time to be like, hey, we're going to talk to you about, I don't know, I don't have any examples. My wife is perfect. I couldn't even, I couldn't even think of anything to finish that sentence with. But pick your battles and pick your moments. There's something really, really beautiful with a fitting reply to say the right thing at the right time. Proverbs 25, 11 through 12 says this. Timely advice is what? Lovely. Ah, oh, just it was the perfect thing I needed to hear. And I love this. It's like golden apples in a silver basket. There's some interior design for you. Courtesy of Proverbs. Timely advice is like that. And I love this too. Here, here, here's the call to us. The one who listens, valid criticism is like gold earring or gold jewelry. May we adorn ourselves in wisdom. May we, right, put on, uh, put on the bling of wisdom. That's lame, but I, did, I said it and you heard it. 
timely advice is lovely. We want to say the things at the right time. And often that, of course, takes prayer and discernment. But I think it's just, I, like, I think most of us have the common sense of, of just, now's not the right time. Or, hey, I'll, when you get a second, I want, I want to talk about this, right? I think often, like, if, if you have young kids, like, Chris and I, we laugh so much, like, you, you, just, you just can't have a conversation when the kids are awake at any time. We'll be driving, like, hey, honey, it's like, you're ignoring me. Like, no, I, I started a sentence, right? It's, it's when the kids are asleep. Doing okay? Let's talk about this. Hey, we want to dream about this. Let's plan about this. We want to say things again. We want to be the right person. We want to say it in the right way. We want to say it at the right time. Again, pick your battles and pick your moments. And lastly is this, with the right people. So I want to talk to you. Proverbs has so much to say about slander, about gossip, about deceptive words. Also, which we didn't have time for today, about flattery, which is just lying by just puffing someone up in ways that aren't truthful or helpful. But I think to this day, this is the best definition of gossip I've ever read. It's from the book Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. It says this, he says this, gossip is what? Let's really define our terms here. Gossip is talking about an issue with someone who is not a part of the problem or the solution. Gossip is what talking about an issue with someone who is not a part of the problem or a part of the solution. I've harped on this for 12 years now in our time together, but it feels like to this day still, gossip is the number one pastime of church people. It is their favorite thing to do. Second only to going out and eating too much after church on Sunday. You sit and you eat and you talk about people that you just worshiped right next to. Have you heard? Have you seen? Oh, I heard. And we don't care if it's truthful. We don't care if it's hurtful. We just, we get this high off of, to say bluntly, talking crap about people. As if we weren't also saved by grace. We would hate for people to be gossiping about us. But we continually gossip. And I, I don't have like an axe to grind with like, and we just had an issue in the church where someone was gossiping. I, I don't know. I hope, I hope not. Please, I don't want to get an email, well, speaking of, right? Did you hear about someone gossips to me <laughs> during church, right? Gossip is talking about an issue with someone who's not a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. I would also say we want to start with Matthew 18. If you have an issue with someone, you heard something about someone, talk to them. Otherwise, shut up. Sorry, there, there is more to say. A little more nuanced than that, but we just have to get better. We have to get better at this. Proverbs, again, has a lot to say. Read this with me. This is kind of funny. Sick and twisted, but it's funny. Proverbs 18.8 says, rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart, right? That's why we call jo gossip what? It's so juicy. Give me that juice, or, or right, the, the new hip thing is, I want that tea, right? Give me that tea, spill, like I spilled the tea, sis. And we all know that, right? It's, oh, it's just so good. And Barbara's saying, yeah, it's delicious and destructive. They're dainty morsels that affect every part of your heart. Proverbs 16, 28 says this. Oh, this is so heartbreaking because I've seen it time and time and time and time again. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife and gossip separates the best of friends. I've seen that just in, in my relatively short time here. 12 years, I don't know. It's not too short, but I've seen that friendship, friendships end over things that could have easily been ironed out if we just sat across from one another and just talked to each other instead of about each other. Things that were just simple misunderstandings or simple thing, a weird thing, and I don't want to make this about me, but a weird thing about, and I, I know it comes to the job of like, I, I get to talk and I get to be on stage. That's a weird thing. So with that comes a lot of misunderstandings. And a weird thing I'm still trying to figure out is just people say things about me. I hear things about me. And they're just simply not true, but I can't fix it. So I have to just live in this weird tension of like, God, help my heart, because it's real easy to get bitter. But I know all of us have dealt with it. You just nod with me. You don't got to raise your hand. We've all dealt with that. You said what about me? I'm sorry. I don't think many of us ever get a chance to have that conversation. We don't really ever get to talk to the original gossiper because it's too viral. It's just the pain. It's just the embarrassment. It's the, it's the who heard this and who knows this and, and the feeling of there's no way to set things right. There's no way. I just have to sit in this hurt now. I'm having a hard time trusting people. We know this, that gossip, what? Spreading strife, it kills friendships. Shoot, it kills families. 
It separates close friends. And I hope today that the, the word of God can, right, living and active can do multiple things. One, I hope that he can heal us. We've all felt that. But by God's grace, may we never be these kind of people. Because Proverbs 26, 20 says this. I love this. Fire goes out without wood. And quarrels, what, disappear when the gossip stops. So I pray, like, new unwritten rule, a part of the bylaws, haha, at Legacy Church, gossip will forever stop with us. If you hear it, it ends with you. And I'll also say this, listening is participating. You can, you can, you can, you can stop someone mid-conversation. Hey, you know what, let's not talk about this. Simple as that, Right? The fire ends, the pain ends, the quarrels end What when the gossip stops. So may it stop at our ears. I pray, again, by God's grace, we would be better than what is so common, just continually slandering and gossiping people. Worship team, you can come on back. We're dismissed with a song. I want to close this out. Would you stand with me? I want to say this again. I pray that we would have wise words that we would be people that continually strive to be wise and discerning and truthful and gracious in our words. And again, what does that look like? Wise words are one from the right person. Maybe today God spoke to you and was like, you know what, this isn't your fight. This is tearing you up, but it's not tearing them up, and so you need to give it to me and let it go. It needs to come from the right person to, again, in the right way. I pray that our speech may be seasoned with salt, that when people hear from us, they hear wisdom, they hear grace, they hear love, they sense and feel the Spirit of God. Again, a soft answer turns away wrath. That's so uncommon. Again, at the right time, a fitting, timely answer is so good. Like, right, like just beautiful, beautiful golden apples. Like, oh, thank you so much for that. Pick your battles and pick your moments. And again, may we always talk with the right people. Again, that's someone who is a part of the problem or can be a part of the solution, which, sorry, let me, let me just rant on that for 30 seconds. Part of the solution. I think oftentimes you can say, can I ask for your wisdom about a situation? And I think there's wisdom in saying, you don't need to give all the dirty details, but like, I'm going to go talk to so-and-so. Can, am, I, am I just seeing this the wrong way? I've done that many times, like with the board, with the staff, 100,000 million times this week with my wife, Kristen. But what will often happen is you'll talk to that person, and then you hopefully go and talk to the individual, right? But then this person never hears what happened. So they just heard there was an issue. So just, I pray by God's grace, you're just like, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to talk to them, and then you come back and be like, here's what God did. Thank you for praying. God, I think those are trusted, trusted friends. Proverbs talks a lot about that. You can keep an issue secret. I'm not talking about gossiping in the name of praying. That's too often, too. But it's the right people, people that are either part of the problem or they can be part of the solution. We end our time with this, Proverbs 12, 25. Man, this really spoke to me, especially about the, the mental health series we just ended. It says, this anxiety weighs down the heart. Right, the pains of life, the turmoil of life, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. I pray all of us would just strive for that right there. That, that when people hear from us, it cheers them up. It strengthens them. It gives them more wisdom. Not, ugh, it's so exhausting hearing from you because what, you're so negative and you gossip so much. No, I pray that we would be the kind of people that speak spiritual life into others. Amen, church? Amen. I pray that in a world that is hurting, in a world that is so weighed down, may the grace and mercy of Christ in us cheer them up and speak a better word by the power of Jesus. Let me pray over us as we dismiss with some worship. God, I pray first that the truth of the gospel, the, the, the word that we are holy and blameless before you, that we are righteous, that we are loved, that we are adopted into your family, that it is finished, that those words would resonate continually in our hearts and our souls, every fiber of our being. And from there, we can pour into others. 
God, I pray against gossip. I pray against the pain of slander. I pray against pride. I pray against anger in a way that is, that is uh, unrighteous, sinful, and destructive. God, would you do a work of healing and, and a work of, of supernatural surgery when it comes to the way we speak about ourselves and about others? Death and life and the power of the tongue. God, we lean into you and say, God, may we be people of life continually. I pray that we would be people that when we speak to others, it is edifying. It builds them up instead of tear them down. God, I pray that many of us just need to say, God, forgive me. I have had such harsh, angry words. I have been slandered. I've been a gossip. And I pray that you would put us on the right path today. And we would walk in wisdom and wholeness. In your name, amen.